Welcome to Courageous Leadership with Virginia Prodan, training you to lead with courage. Hello, everybody. We are so happy we have you here. We are so happy that you are interested in discovering the leader in you. We love to train you. And many times you heard me, God built my leadership in me, even under horrible circumstances. Many of you read my memoir, Saving My Assassin, but Courageous Leadership with Virginia Pradhan, it's more than that. We love to bring our, our audience, courageous leaders, like the guests that we have today, that will teach us even more. And our courageous leader is Jack Hennings. We um, um, met a long time ago, and uh, he has a great influence on my family and my son. Um, many of you know for sure that he is a three-time Super Bowl champion, uh, United States Air Force veteran. He achieved many, many successes in his life after nine years with Dallas Cowboys. And he retired in 2000, 2001 with three Super Bowl rings. I had seen them. They're beautiful. Um, after that, Chad Hennings um, um, developed a successful commercial real estate uh, um, business. He is a, an, in management consulting, a motivation speaker, and an author of three books. It takes commitment, rules of engagement, and forces of character. And I have to say, in the last book, Forces of Character, I had the honor to be part of it. And I'm so honored, Chad, for you to be here. I know you're busy, and we uh, we value your presence here. So. Um, I, I know I said that's just a short, short uh, bio. If you want to introduce yourself to our audience, please do it. Virginia, it is a pleasure to be on with you on this, this podcast. Um, I've been an admirer of yours for what you've done, what you stand for, how you've raised your family. And um, I'm, I'm so proud of what you're continuing to do to serve in the kingdom today. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Chad, I would love for you to um, tell our audience how you started, because many people, especially in our condition and situation in America, they are afraid to start. They believe that in order to start, you have to have everything lined up. Would you share with us how you started? Well, I, you know, for me, I, I had a great foundation that was instilled in me the aspects of character integrity of knowing identity, of purpose, of sense of mission. I grew up on a farm in Iowa and on that small family farm that has been in our family now for over almost 140 years. You know, I watched my father, I watched my grandfather, I watched my aunts, uncles, you know, my family work. And to me, it instilled in me that, that sense that if you want to accomplish anything, it, nothing's going to be handed to you. you. You have to earn it. You have to work at it. And I took that, that ethic, that mindset to everything that I approached in life, whether that was academics in school, whether that was athletics. And, you know, my time at the Air Force Academy, uh, where I played football there and went on to end up flying jets for four years prior to joining the Dallas Cowboys. You know, along the whole way, it was, you know, I had goals. I said goals. I had aspirations. But it was in essence of that living that life of excellence you know, that we've talked many times about is that being your best self every day. Some days you just, you don't have it. You don't have your A game with you, but you go out there and you give it your best shot, however you can be. And then the most important thing that I realized too, was that it's not about me. It's, it was never just about me that anything that you accomplish in life, you're part of a team. You're part of something that is greater than self. And then with that, I was able to, you know, have great people surround myself with, whether that was teammates, whether that was my fellow wingmen <clears throat> when flying, or, you know, as my partners in business. It's, it's the team where I derive more satisfaction. You know, I'm able to accomplish so much more than I can as an individual. And, you know, it's, it's that sense of commitment that 
some days you're going to get knocked in the teeth. You're going to get knocked down. But do you quit? Do you roll over? No, you keep keep on keeping on. And that's that great American work ethic that this country is founded upon is perseverance and resilience. That is uh, um, so important what you said. Uh, we have a little bit of glitch here. I don't know if you can hear me, um, but... Um, I believe the work ethic, the significance that you said, there is a significance in each one of us that is a um, skill and talent that God put in us, not only for our benefit, but for benefit of others around. And you exemplify that. And um, you you have done so much. I I know when uh, uh, you were in the um, um, Senate Senate United States Committee for to send uh, um, young people to Air Force Academy. I I met you there, and you had a wonderful impact not only on my son's life but on the life of many young people and i believe that's what uh, courageous leaders will will do what would you advise young people that maybe never had the opportunity to have a family like yours you know one of the things that i encourage everyone is you know the last thing that Christ said to his disciples before he ascended to heaven was, you know, the great commission, go and make disciples. And that's what we as members of the body of Christ are called to do, make disciples. So with that, it's who's discipling you, you know, who's mentoring you find someone that can seed life's wisdom. And that's knowledge applied, you know, life experiences into you. And then also we are, with that, mentorship is a two-way street. Whoever's mentoring you, then you find who are you mentoring. So if you're a young adult, you know, who's, you know, someone older than you that in your sphere of life that has influence over you, listen, learn from them. But then also who's that, maybe that elementary school, that middle school, that high schooler that you can then mentor and, and help along the path of life because it's, it's, we are all a part of the body of Christ. We all have different skill sets. We all have, you know, different strengths and weaknesses, and it, t it takes all of us to succeed. And that's the way God had intended it to be. We need each other. That is so true. If we take Christ's example, many times he said when he was here, I don't do anything other than what my father tells me. In another word, he told us that he was led by his father in order later on to be raised up to the highest level that the Father um, gave Christ. There is no other name in this world higher than, than Christ. So in order to be led, you have to be a leader. You have to be led by someone. We want everyone to be led by Christ and humanly, like you said, by by someone. And um, uh, that will in put in their lives something really special. And you have done this not only in your business, but also in your ministry. Can you talk just a little bit about your ministry? You bet. Um, as I alluded to that, you know, truly our purpose, Virginia, is, as you well know, and that's what we discussed when we had that conversation in my book about forces of characters. What type of legacy are you leaving? are leaving behind to others. And, you know, for me, a, a legacy is not, it's not about material possessions accumulated or accomplishments, things you've been able to achieve, or even those areas in life where you failed it. To me, legacy is about relationships and it's about planting those seeds for the next generation. And that was one of the things that prompted me to start a men's ministry called wingman, where it's purely about discipleship, where we're, engaging men in small groups and one-on-one -on -one to dive deeper, to walk through life together, hand in hand. And I, and I make the analogy of, as a pilot, when I was either flying a, a combat or a training mission, I, I never went solo. I was always had a wingman with me. And if I was leading the flight or if uh, I was as a wingman, a number two, 
we would be there to mutually support one another because the success of our mission, if we were off doing our own thing, the success of our mission would go down and the likelihood of something bad happening to us would go way up. So that's why, you know, I draw that, that, that word picture of what it means to be a wingman for us to walk through life because we need each other. We need relationships. And that's where we, we have small groups throughout all, you know, throughout the United States now of men gathering together regularly, weekly to support, to accept, to affirm, and to hold each other accountable. Well, you said something very important. I mean, every day you said it's important, but accountability, it's so important. It is so important. Yes, it was part of uh, uh, your academy training. And as a mother, I, I remember watching my son from a high school being transformed during the academy and all his years, you know, the current years in, in the Air Force being transformed wonderfully and his skill and talent being so much developed as, as a leader. But accountability is very, very important sometimes. And you have to be open to things that you go in life, things that work and they don't work and, and so forth. How do you think that accountability will work in the life of a young person who might think, oh, I don't know who, who, where to find those people that will train me? You know, first and foremost, it's ask God. Get on your knees in prayer. You know, it's if you don't have friendships or relationships, you know, ask God about that. And, you know, he has been faithful in, in my experience in life and, and the men that I know that have wanted that, it's, you have to first and foremost ask God in prayer, but then you have to have the, uh, the courage at times to take risks, you know, for a young person that, you know, wants that mentor say, Hey, you know, walk up to somebody that you admire, at least from afar and just say, Hey, you mind grabbing a cup of coffee? You know, I just love to be able to ask you some questions just about life, you know, and, and I'm confident the individual will say, yeah, you know, that's, it's low threat. It's, it's not much, but yeah, I'll be happy to do that. And because I, I can tell you there's, there is this divide between uh, generation Z or the millennials and, and us as baby boomers and above is the fact that relationally, sometimes we don't think as older men think that we have anything to, to give and to offer to the younger generation because, you know, their technology, they speak a different language, you know, they just culturally, they're different. And that young person is the same. Why would that older individual that has lived life, that has accomplished so much, why would they want to, um, you know, see seeds into my life? And that's where there's this disconnect and this valley, this chasm between, but it's, God wants us to come together and we sometimes somebody just needs to take that risk and take that chance and say, Hey, let's go grab a cup of coffee or go grab lunch someplace, you know, my treat. That's how relationships start organically. That's amazing. Just one question. Take the risk and ask a question. It's amazing. It's so true. I will also ask you, what do you think? How do you help? business people that are under so much pressure today, you know, all with all the demands and changes from the government and everything, how do you help them? Well, I have a, a commercial real estate company. And, and first of all, we, I help them by getting to know them on a personal level, getting to know them, you know, their business, getting to know where, where their needs are, where their pain points are. And if I can offer any assistance, any help, any guidance, that's where I plug in. It's, you know, from a sales perspective, so many people, and I'll call it being that used salesman, used car salesman, where they're going to come in and they're just going to want to push their wares, get you to, to buy something that you don't necessarily need without taking the time to listen. And that's a, that's a lost art that I think has been lost in our culture and our society today is people, they may hear you, but they don't listen. Because the first thing they want to do is they're thinking about, okay, what am I going to say next? As opposed to listening and hearing what the individual is saying, where you can truly have an impact then on their lives. So I try to take it beyond just 
executing the X's and O's per se of a business transaction to take it down more on a personal level to get to know my clients, to get to know those individuals that you know I am pursuing business relationships with, because that's where it's it's sustaining. If you can meet a person on that level, then then there's the trust, then there's the uh, esprit de corps, then then that's where great things can be accomplished. I believe that you will agree with me that the same the same principle, or at least I use when I am invited to speak somewhere at a company, uh, the college, or I try to uh, to learn first about them, about their needs and everything. And I am so amazed that when I take that risk, like you said, and I ask how many people will say, yes, I will, I will be happy to go and, and have coffee with you or talk over the phone or something. Do you agree that the same principle that you said in the business will work if you are an author or a, or a speaker to speak somewhere to apply the same principles? Oh, it's a universal truth. I wholeheartedly agree that we as human beings, we need that connectivity, that, that connection. That's why I, I'm really personally struggling with a lot of businesses that are choosing not to go back into the office. I understand there's the fear and the anxiety of COVID, et cetera, and the what ifs, but they're always going to be there. And when people where they can't accomplish what you and I are doing via a, a virtual connection, people need actually to be in the same room physically with one another, looking each other in the eye and being in the presence of others to truly develop that, that connectivity. If, if you don't, then I just, I can't see how we physiologically, spiritually, emotionally, physically can continue as a community where we don't have the face-to-face interactions. We need those on a daily basis. You are so right about this, and not only in business, but only uh, also in our churches. We need, I know it's more comfortable maybe to be in your pajamas and watch uh, the church uh, um, sermon on, uh, on Zoom, but we need to step out of whatever we call comfort and go in, in our churches and, and be there. And I had the privilege to go and speak uh, at church and half of the church was there, you know, with distance and everything. And half of the church was on, on online. But we need, we need that before we hope that will never happen, that churches will be closed or something like this. But when we don't go to church, we don't sit in the pew or, like you said, um, we don't go to work. We are part of the problems. We are agreeing with what, in many ways, the government is trying to push. So if you want to be part of the solution, go to, to your office. God is the protector, and be, be careful, go to church. But talking about church, I want to ask you, many of, uh, of our pastors uh, preach the gospel and nothing but the gospel. But we have to admit that there are pastors that are very, very uh, cautious, and some of them are even fearful to to talk about different things or eliminate those things in fear that people will not donate, will not come to church, or even fear of government. How do you help those those pastors? You know, I, I the one thing is is the uh, the gospel is controversial, and it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. Whether you're presenting the gospel or you're addressing cultural issues through the lens, the prism of the gospel. I would encourage pastors. It's, you know, I would challenge pastors in the fact that one, were you putting your trust in, in man or, you know, in God, the Holy spirit to build your church and then in <laughs> getting totally transparent and, and, um, and just being blunt. I mean, whose kingdom are you building? Is it building your own fiefdom or are you building God's kingdom? Because there is only one kingdom. And that is the kingdom of Jesus Christ. 
here on earth. And, you know, I, I see that same thing. It's, it's frustrating. And I just encourage pastors that to be bold, to stand out, are, are you know, as, as pastors, as teachers, you're going to be um, judged at a higher standard than many of us others who, who aren't teachers. I mean, as, as St. Paul says, so it is, you know, your duty is to be forthright, unapologetic in your presentation of the gospel with grace and mercy. But we are to lead our flock, and it's it's to step up and to be bold. Yes, uh, my I always have in mind when I'm confronted with because we all have a fear. Fear it's a good motivator because he can motivate you to follow Christ even closer. And when I have that, shall I say, to make sure that I say it in love, I always remember Proverbs 21.30. There is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. If I am under God's wings, if I proclaim his kingdom, nothing is going to change. No power on this earth than I have my own example. I live under the most ferocious dictator who had everything under his fingertips, you know, money, police, everything. And he is dead and I'm alive. So God is, God never lost a battle. We are soldiers in his army and we Amen. need to be strong and courageous. You are so right about that. Whose kingdom are you building? You have to ask yourself. And if you build Christ's kingdom, you just stay under God's wings. Psalm 91. Amen. You know, it's everybody. I, I so appreciate what you said. Everybody, we all experience fear, but not everybody experiences and goes forth with the mindset of courage that in spite of your fear, you're going to press. You're going to run to the sound of the gun. You know, and I'm reminded of a good friend of mine, Tom Doyle, wrote a book about dreams and visions about his experience of evangelism in the Middle East, where a lot of our former Muslim brothers and sisters that have converted, made a professional belief in Jesus Christ, living in, in areas that are, there's a lot of persecution, as you did, but they fully anticipate. And this is the mindset that we as Americans have had, I guess, too much apathy and comfort for so long, they fully anticipate to die for their faith. I mean, when they make that profession of faith in Jesus Christ, they fully anticipate that it will cost them their physical life at some point in time. And that's where I pray that, oh, I wish that we here in this country, that I could have the courage to face each day with that mindset of being able to profess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, no matter what the world or the government or the community or those around me will say and, and push against, because if, if not me, then who? So I, I appreciate what you share there, Virginia. I appreciate what you share too, because Chad, when we stand up and we say, no matter what, I will follow Christ like others before me, we influence others because others will see the joy, the courage, the strongness that Christ builds in us, and they will, will follow us. They will, will want to be strong and courageous in Christ. Many times I tell people, I am under five feet tall, but it, there is a huge God inside of me. And I said to people, come on, let's um, join the winning team. Christ never lost a battle. I am in the winning team. So I hope that people take take that uh, to heart, and uh, they will. Faith requires uh, requires actions by faith. Without actions, faith is dead. We know that. I just want to thank you so very much. We just scratched the surface, and we you can offer so much. We're gonna invite you more to talk about more about your your ministry. You do more than that you share right now, but we love to invite you again. We want to thank you for your time, for your values that you you share with us, and um, we are so grateful for your time. Thank you, Virginia. It's an honor to be on with you. Thank you.
want to know more about Virginia Prodan, her coaching program, buy her book, Saving My Assassin, or invite Virginia to speak at your events, visit virginiaprodanbooks.com. 